Time now for the legal beat with Newberger and Partners playing talk about legal liberty and social justice issues that impact all Canadians, what we need to know and want to talk about today. Of course, joined in studio by Joseph Newberger. Great to see you, sir. You too. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. It is quite astounding what we heard in court yesterday. Yes. Um, so we've learned a lot about this other prosecution. And we know that this was severed from the others because it was a completely different type of case, factually. This was in the workplace. It involved sexual harassment. We know from the information that was provided in the media that there was apparently a witness to the particular act. And there was an email right after the act which was sent to a colleague complaining about it. And so it was really a different type of set of facts. And what's uh, very significant here is that there was this uh, negotiated resolution. So it started as early as March, mm -hmm. initiated by the defense. And um, I know Ms. Burrell must have been significantly involved in whether this would be an appropriate resolution. And the insistence on the apology was probably the crucial factor. Now, some... Uh, Lucy Ducutera came out and said she wishes that somebody had offered or pre presented that as an option to some of the other complainants. Um, hmm. So I, I don't know now. And then there's also yeah. talk about, you know, the finger pointing at the CBC and should there be an inquiry and people saying, well, that's going to cost $20, yeah. $25 million. Yeah. And um, I, this happened ye some years ago. Yeah. Do we not think that political correctness has taken a good hold in almost every workplace now? Well, I mean, I'm familiar with cases that arise out of mm -hmm. workplaces. I mean, I, I defend a lot of them. And there are very robust uh, policies with respect to workplace harassment and sexual harassment. And there are mechanisms and processes in place. If you're unionized, you go to your union rep, then they go to HR. And investigations do occur, and steps are taken to terminate uh, individuals who are engaged in that type of behavior. So I think CBC maybe at this stage still needs to do a little bit more work. Um, and I'm not sure if something would come down the pipe in regard to some sort of civil action as a result of what we've heard yesterday. But um, I don't think we need an inquiry. We don't need to spend money That's on that. It's a lot of money. No, it's I a lot of money. When, and, I you heard, know. Yeah, when I heard about it, I thought, why don't we just forget that, send that to Attawapiskat yeah. for help, yeah. and, and, you know, let, let it, you know, they will, they will deal with it. And I have to say, Sharon, you and I... Mm -hmm. Worked. Uh, I heard somebody this morning say, "Oh, that would never, that would never happen at another, um, at another broadcaster." But yeah. we we experienced it, that. Yeah. Yeah. It was years ago, yeah. but it was fairly commonplace, and I had yeah. no problem saying to somebody, "Yes, I'm absolutely. I will go do that." And by the way, get your hands off but my butt. Therein is the difference. <laughs> right. Therein is the difference. Whereas now we are. A trip to HR back then was a real last resort. Cause you dealt with it yourself. And yeah. then it was a last resort. Now it almost seems like the first course of action. Yeah, I mean, you know, it depends on the individual, I guess, that you're dealing with. And I'm not saying Ms. Burrell isn't a strong mm -hmm. individual because she came through all of this. But, you know, some people may speak up and tell the individual to, you know, not do it and, right. and, yeah. and straighten out their behavior. Otherwise, right. something will happen. But, you know, uh, an environment could have been created because of this particular Person. individual involved yes. that, you know, allowed this to be perpetuated. Mm -hmm. And so you can't um, take that out of the equation. No, no, I am not uh, 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 belittling yeah. no, no. or in any way passing judgment on the way she handled it yeah. or didn't handle it or the way anyone is handling it mm -hmm. or not handling it. I'm just saying that uh, we... It's we, existed a long time. It, that's it, it, oh, yeah. it existed yeah. with big stars at where we worked and and we handled it, but it was a different era then. It was and, and many years ago and it was sort of... Uh, we didn't consider it sexual harassment to have workmen whistle at us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let's, let's put this into a larger perspective. I mean, this type of behavior can go on in other environments and other workplaces where you don't exactly. have big stars, mm -hmm. you know. Exactly. In this particular case, you have a peace bond <laughs> in, exactly. a, in an instance exactly. where somebody had committed... You know, from what we can tell from the evidence, uh, a sexual assault. Now, moving on to a case that is really horrific, oh, which yeah. is this the, the Tim Bosman yeah. case, and yeah. and you can perhaps uh, uh, 
give greater details to our listeners about what we heard yesterday, which was really bone chilling. Yeah, so we've heard now, uh, we knew that Mr. Schmidt would be testifying in his own defense. They, his lawyer, who's very experienced, very bright lawyer, mm -hmm. indicated that they would be calling evidence, and of course, uh, he's the first one to testify. And uh, it's no surprise to anyone that he is now clearly pointing the finger at the co-accused Mr. Millard as uh, the one who uh, decided to do this on his own, that um, they had been engaged in other criminal acts, I guess for thrills, on prior occasions with nobody ever being harmed. So what he's saying is he had no idea that uh, Mr. Millard was going to uh, engage in any type of physical behavior with uh, with the deceased Mr. Bosma, and um, that in fact after that happened he was very surprised by it, that uh, Mr. Millard looked uh, crazy, and he asked for his help, but Mr. Schmidt said that you know he was feeling compelled, I guess, to, to cooperate to some extent, but didn't cooperate to the full extent that Mr. Millard had asked. But it's very chilling, because this is the first direct account now of how the death occurred or how the murder occurred. It is a very detailed account of what happened, and um, nobody has heard something direct until now. Well, and this is the first account we heard that Mr. Smith wasn't in the vehicle, according to his testimony. Right. He's saying that he was following behind in the vehicle that they had arrived in, and that obviously the murder had taken place it, without him being in the vehicle, that because, was Mr. Bosman's yeah, vehicle. Because he said he saw a bullet um, in, hole. Yeah. And and then he said something about, he was asked why he didn't do something, and he said, well, he, he had to go to a wedding? I mean, right. just Well, he didn't, re he didn't report it to police because, because of family wedding, and he didn't want to cause problems. disruption. I mean, it's just surreal. Yeah, well, look, I mean, human behavior is odd. Some people have very odd reasons for saying what they do. Whether that's a believable explanation, mm -hmm. that's going to be up to the jury, right? Um, and there's been a lot of evidence about, um, let's say, indirect evidence about how this occurred. It's been a very strong case marshaled by the Crown. Um, and the jury is going to have to really carefully scrutinize this evidence and see if any of this is capable of being believed. Well, let me just say that Sharon and I were talking about this this morning, mm -hmm. and both of us, when we heard that he was following behind in another vehicle, that set off flags, flags yeah. for me. I mean, bells went off. Why would he be following in another vehicle? Yeah, like if you were not part of this test drive situation, <clears throat> either you would wait in the other vehicle with the dog, apparently, that was in the car. Yes. For If you're not participating in the test drive, then why would you follow it to come back? Th to me, that was just red flags all over the place. Well, and, and also the explanation is that um, he was following behind, and the plan was to basically case it out and come back mm -hmm. later to steal the vehicle. So you don't really need to then follow behind exactly. in order to do that. You would be following behind maybe if you knew something was going to happen, you were going to ste steal the vehicle at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I don't want to uh, prejudge uh, the evidence which is coming out. It's up to the, mm -hmm. to the jury to decide uh, when all of it is out. And he's going to be faced with very strong cross-examination. And in cross-examination, the Crown is going to put forward all these types of factors right. that you're raising right now to try and undermine the credibility of, of what he's saying. It's, it's horrific. Be, well, it's going to be interesting, though. I'm really curious to, to hear what comes out of the cross-examination. Exa well, I, I think the, the Crown will do, as they've laid out in a very methodical way, uh, their case, building it against Mr. Millard and Mr. Uh, Schmidt, I think what, uh, what they're going to do is take those elements which uh, directly make some of his uh, assertions unreasonable, and they're going to face mm -hmm. him with it right away in cross-examination. And, you know, we'll see whether he can withstand that type of pressure. Right. And what do you think about Mr. Millard not taking the stand himself? Does it go to those, those letters that we saw where he was oh, those practicing? The, yeah, and, the, yeah. The, that type of evidence. I mean, you know, uh, that witness has her own credibility issues, yes. but there's a significant amount of uh, a very probative evidence that came out from, from her evidence. And the case, as it was built against Mr. Millard, is very strong. The incinerator, the remains... Uh, you know, going out there in the first place, the identification of him being there. It's a very strong case against Mr. Mm -hmm. Millard, and, and he is going to take the position that the evidence is circumstantial and doesn't point to him being directly involved in the homicide. And, of course, the co-accused evidence is evidence to uh, diminish his own liability but does not directly go against Mr. Millard to prove his guilt. So that's a careful instruction that anybody who's listening to this is not going to really yeah. understand, uh, but the judge is going to have to explain to the jury that um, they, they cannot directly use that as evidence against Mr. Millard to prove his culpability for first or second degree murder.
Mm. So mm. it's going to be quite challenging. Would there be any situation where he might decide he might want to testify? Well, uh, has that ever happened? Uh, I, I'm sure it has in the past. I, I think he, you know, he's also well represented, and I think there has been very careful thought put into whether he will testify or not. I think there are facts which are very difficult maybe for him to explain in cross-examination, and he may be relying on the fact that, again, other persons could have had access to uh, this location, but uh, it, it's, I, I think it's a very difficult case for Mr. Lord to succeed on, mm -hmm. and I don't know what he could say in his own defense in, in, uh, in his testimony that would really help him. But would his lawyers have known or had any inkling that his friend would... Uh, would give the testimony that he gave. Maybe not. I mean, you know, um, you would you would generally understand the tenor of the case between the two, mm -hmm. let's say, defense teams as the case progresses. Mm -hmm. So typically, either you'll be talking about cross examination and the theory of the defense, or there's going to be absolute silence between you. And it's not that you don't say hi and how are you, but you will know from the method of cross examination and the interaction you have with the uh, counsel for the co accused as to whether they're going to have a conflictual defense and whether they're going to be pointing the finger at your client. And I'm sure these are all experienced veteran lawyers, and they, they would have, you know, Mr. Millard's team would have understood that this is a possibility. They would not have necessarily known the direct content of his evidence, of course. Mm -hmm. Nobody's heard it up till now. Um, but uh, And I think we've seen from some of the reactions that's been described, at least in the reporting, that Millard is, you know, staring at him and, and you know, this mm -hmm. may be somewhat unknown to him. And, you know, that in and of itself may, may have a, a factor for the jury and when they assess. Because jur juries look very carefully at witnesses. They're going to always be looking at the accused. Right. So, you know, these types of cues are very important as to how a, a jury will assess the evidence as a whole. Okay. Now, you, as an experienced criminal lawyer, do you have that sense when you're defending somebody and you've Absolutely. got another defense lawyer? You, you And if you're not communicating, if you haven't got a where you're going out for lunch together, where you're kind of on the same... Do you, do you ha instinctively know? Yes. Yeah, I mean, if you've got experience at trial, you know what's mm -hmm. going on. And, and you will also know from the way cross-examination uh, proceeds through the trial, because your co-accused will then be trying to cross-examine to lessen as much as possible any evidence, direct or indirect, to suggest that uh, his client was a party to this homicide. And it may simply be directed at some assistance afterward, but you're trying to diminish or negate or eliminate any evidence that could establish he was either in the truck mm -hmm. or he had any knowledge. And sometimes lack of cross-examination on very important issues will tell you a lot as well, because a smart lawyer will always know, a smart trial lawyer will know there's times to ask questions and there's times not to. All this will clearly signal to the other lawyer what's going on and what to expect. Mm -hmm. So if he is not found guilty of first degree yeah. because of this testimony, mm -hmm. yeah. he would still be found guilty of something. Well, yeah, it depends. So uh, the judge will explain, and it's hard for me to explain right now, but there is uh, the participation in a homicide uh, has, to, has to assist with the, with the killing. And it's not um, to a, an extreme degree where the person has to be necessarily an active participant. The judge will go through all of the elements to establish liability for um, a party to the offense and uh, the jury will listen very carefully and it's, this type of instruction has been very well written down and, and established. So the jury will have to consider whether m this gentleman knew that there was going to be a killing. If he didn't know there was a killing, did he assist at all in the furtherance of that killing and therefore is still liable under a first degree or maybe a second degree or a manslaughter? Mm -hmm. Or, if, if the liability isn't established in that regard, then is he an accessory after the fact? Well, the fact that he didn't call police because he had a wedding. Yeah. Well, you know, that doesn't necessarily make him liable. No. But, but, mm -hmm. but there clearly was, from his evidence, some assistance in dealing with the offense and mm -hmm. concealing it afterwards. So an accessory is a fait accompli, really. Um, I think the larger issue is whether what he's saying can sufficiently convince a jury to distance himself from any knowledge of, uh, of what was going to happen. And um, again, you have to take into consideration that um, Smitch has indicated that he and uh, Mr. Millard had embarked on other prior criminal acts right. before. Uh, he was, in fact, his drug dealer, and then they became close friends. So the jury will have to take all that into consideration to conclude, really, did he not know what was going on? Was he really not a party to what was going on? 
look, it's, uh, you know, we're not there for the trial. So right. we don't know all the facts that's come out through uh, examination and cross-examination. That's what the jury is there for, and they will make that determination at the appropriate time. So do we have any idea about timing on this now? Well, I suspect, you know, this will go on for at least another day through chief, uh, and then cross-examination could last, uh, you know, several hours to several days. It depends on the surgical approach taken by uh, by the uh, Crown. But there are a number of factors that the Crown's going to need to put to uh, this witness. Um, and, you know, it doesn't seem that there's going to be much other evidence to call uh, in his own defense. Uh, once that concludes, then um, the Crown then has an option of calling any reply evidence, which I don't think they will in this case. And then it goes to the jury phase, where there will be some time taken off for the lawyers to sort of write their closing arguments and for uh, the instructions to be developed. Well, just heartbreaking. I hear that both uh, his mother and his wife Why, had yeah. to leave the courtroom yesterday. They were just so overtaken with yeah. with emotion. I mean, I cannot imagine mm -hmm. sitting in that courtroom listening to those details. No. Well, uh, up till now, it's been incredibly difficult because when you hear about the remains and everything, but this is the first direct account of what happened. There is no direct account. So it's incredibly difficult for any family member to hear. Well, we'll yeah. be talking to you about this a whole lot more, I believe, in the days ahead. Thank you so much, Joseph. Pleasure. Thank you. Always a pleasure having you here. That's today's Thank Legal you. Beat brought to you by Newberger & Partners, one of Canada's leading criminal defense law firms expertly defending clients since 1992. Visit them online at nrlawyers.com. We are going to head into a break. Still more to chat about on the other side. And your local Allstate insurance agents live and work right near you. They're familiar with the risks in the area, so they know the most common claims and how to protect you, contact a local agency or get an online quote at allstate.ca. That's allstate.ca. Click the channel subscribe button for full-length interviews and more from What She Said here on YouTube.